what happens when we draw an ellipse in the complex plane and then square it? It turns out we get another ellipse, but instead of being centred at the origin, this one's centred at a focus. What happens if we square it again? We don't get an ellipse anymore. So there's something special about squaring our ellipse centred at the origin. The ellipse with a focus at the origin reminds us of the shape of an orbit of an object in a gravitational field, like the Earth orbiting the Sun. Although the orbit of the Earth around the Sun is almost a circle, there are some very eccentric orbits like those of comets, and it turns out we can get any elliptical orbit. There's another orbit we can create easily if we hang a long pendulum above the origin of a table, then give it a small push. The end of the pendulum moves effectively on the table since it's long. It traces out an ellipse centered at the origin. This was the ellipse we squared to get the gravitational orbit. We'll see the connection between the pendulum ellipse and the planet's ellipse later, but first let's show the pendulum does give us an ellipse. For our pendulum, it traces an ellipse since the force is approximately linear, i.e. proportional to the distance from the origin. This can be seen by small angle approximations, since a long pendulum will only form a small angle. We can also notice that the force always points towards the origin, above which the pendulum is hanging. We call these kinds of forces central, in that they always point to the origin. If we look at Newton's equations of motion, we can see why we get an elliptical orbit. Let's work in the complex plane, then the trajectory is the solution to z double dot of t equals minus z of t. From now on, we'll let the mass of the particle be 1, so we don't have to worry about it, and force is equal to acceleration. This has solution p e to the i t plus q e to the minus i t. We can see this as an ellipse by writing it as a sum of sine and cosine. When we square this orbit in the complex plane, we get the following, which is an ellipse with foci at plus or minus 2 pq shifted by 2 pq, so is an ellipse with one focus at the origin. Now we've noticed this connection, we want to use it to prove the orbits in an inverse square gravitational field are ellipses. To do this, we'll use some complex analysis and geometry to understand how force and orbits change when we square. It turns out that the link between the shape of our orbits and the force that generates them is curvature. We want curvature to measure how much a curve is curving, we can consider the angle the curve makes with the horizontal, i.e. the argument of its tangent complex number. Then we let curvature be the rate of change of this angle as we move along the curve. Since the rate of change depends on how quickly we move along the curve, we need to move along the curve at unit speed, i.e. take the derivative with respect to arc length. A good way to think about curvature is a circle. If the radius is r, the curvature is 1 over r. This can be seen since the angle of the tangent changes at a constant rate, and it changes by 2 pi as we go around the circle once, which has length 2 pi r, so this rate of change must be 2 pi over 2 pi r, which is 1 over r. Another example is that a straight line has zero curvature. The tangent is always the same, so it has zero rate of change. Now we would like to investigate the relationship between the linear force field and the squaring operation. To do this, it will be helpful to think about the curvature of the orbit. Force speeds up and curves the trajectory of a particle. The component of force parallel to velocity speeds up the particle, and the component perpendicular to velocity curves the orbit without changing speed. We can decompose into parallel and perpendicular parts, then only worry about the perpendicular part, since we are just interested in the shape of the orbit not the speed at which it is traversed. By parameterizing the path and differentiating, we can derive an expression for the centripetal force. And we can combine the previous two formulae. Now we can decompose the velocity into parts parallel and perpendicular to the force. Note that the angle is the same as before. Then conservation of angular momentum allows us to express the speed of the orbit in terms of geometric properties of the orbit the distance from origin and angle of the tangent. Now we may substitute these equations to eliminate v, and we get f equals h squared kappa over r squared cos cubed gamma. Note that this formula no longer depends on the speed of the orbit, so we can just think about how the shape of the orbit transforms when we square. We'll also need to know how the curvature of an orbit changes when we apply a function to the complex plane. The easiest way to get this result is a little computation. First, we need an expression for the argument of a complex number that we can manipulate. Then we compute the rate of change with arc length. 
Then we plug in z equals f of w and use the chain rule. After all that, we get this formula relating the mapping, the original curvature and the image curvature. To test this formula, let's think about what happens when we expand the complex plane by a factor of r. The map r maps to rz has derivative r and second derivative zero, so our formula reduces to tilde kappa equals kappa over r. This makes sense since a circle of radius 1 over kappa is mapped to a circle of radius r over kappa, which then has curvature kappa over r. Now we would like to relate tilde f and f. We need to relate gamma to gamma tilde. Note the ray through z maps to the ray through z squared, and that the map is complex differentiable, so conformal, so the angle is preserved. So we get that gamma tilde equals gamma. We can apply our formula from before to z tilde equals z squared. Now we can put all our results together. If the force f is linear, the numerator becomes the constant total energy. So f tilde is proportional to 1 over r tilde squared, so we're done. So now we've achieved our goal, we've given an explanation for the focus-centred elliptical shape of orbits in a gravitational field, all using complex analysis and geometry rather than solving the differential equations. Now let's change the laws of physics. What would orbits look like if gravity worked differently? Suppose that instead of being an inverse square central field, our central force was proportional to a different power of r. We can simulate some of these and see what they look like. Now let's try looking at these weird orbits in the complex plane. What would happen if we raise this shape to the fourth power? One of our orbits transforms into the other. Let's try this out for a few more examples of orbits. Notice how we get lots of interesting shapes in these other central force fields. Again, we see that one orbit maps to another. This suggests that our reasoning from earlier extends to other central force fields, and it turns out this is true. We have that every force law pairs up with a dual. This is summarised by the beautiful kastner arnold theorem. Given a central force field where force is proportional to a power of r, there is precisely one dual force field where we can map between the two orbits by taking an appropriate power in the complex plane. They are related by the equations here. Note here that 1 and minus 2 fit, the linear and inverse square laws we saw earlier. All we would need to prove this theorem is the techniques we've already covered in the video. The proof is very similar to the inverse square and linear case we covered. Now that we have the kastner arnold theorem, we can see if there's a force law where the orbits are self-dual, i.e. they map to themselves under this dual process we get that p is p tilde is minus 5, and k is minus 1. Now we need to think of an orbit in this field. If f of r is a r to the minus 5, we can set a equals 0, which will give f of r equals 0, so our particles will travel in a straight line. Now if we apply the duality transformation, so we've found a strange orbit of particles in the inverse fifth power field, one in which particles trace out circles passing through the origin. We can simulate this. We'll leave you with some more cool visuals.